It, uh, we started doing DNA tests for genealogy purposes and ancestry purposes in 2000. Around 2005, I received an email from uh, someone in Brazil that uh, says, I did my DNA test and I got my results. I don't understand very much. Could you please help me? Am I of Arab ancestry? And so I looked at, the, at his results and I uh, looked at his name as well. And I wrote him an email back. I wrote him in Portuguese because it's, as it happens, I'm from Brazil originally. So it was a surprise for him. But I wrote him the following. I said, I looked at your results and I also am looking at your name. And I would tell you that most probably I would say that you are of Jewish ancestry, not Arab ancestry. So I come back home in the evening, I comment with my wife that this happened, and I tell the story to my wife, and she says, are you crazy? He's asking if he's Arab, you're telling him he's Jewish? <laughs> and so uh, <clears throat> next morning I arrive back at the office, and I see I have an email from him, and he starts his email by saying, thank you so much for your answer. This is the kind of answer that I was waiting for all my life. Shalom. Good. So, as uh, Professor Della Perla explained earlier, uh, we have several elements in our DNA. We have the Y chromosome among the different elements. We have the Y chromosome. We have the mitochondrial DNA and we have what we call the autosomal or the recombinant DNA. The Y chromosome is transmitted from the father to the son, to the son, to the son, to the son, almost without mutations or with very small mutations along the, the generations. But there is no influence from spouses along the line. It goes straight down from father to son to grandson, etc. The same way the mitochondrial DNA is transferred from the mother down to the daughter, granddaughter, and so on. It goes also to the son. The, the sons receive the mitochondria from the mother, but they don't transfer down. The, only the females transfer it down. So I have the mitochondria from my mother, the Y chromosome from my father. My children have my wife's mitochondrial DNA. So by looking at the Y chromosome, we can identify the ancestral origins of the paternal line. By looking at the mitochondrial DNA, we can identify the ancestral origins of the maternal line. Again, without any influence of spouses along those lines. The autosomal DNA is the recombinant DNA, is the DNA that we receive from our parents. 50% from the father, 50% from the mother. They received 50% from their parents, and therefore we have 25% of each of the grandparents, 12 and a half percent of the great-grandparents and so on. And so by looking at those three elements of the DNA, we can determine the ancestral origins of the paternal line, which is what I looked at that person that sent me the email from Brazil in 2005. We can look at the ancestral origins of the maternal line. And we can also, through the autosomal DNA, determine the breakdown of the ancestral origins of one person by looking at different regions of the world. What's the composition of my ancestral origins in terms of the different regions of the world? So if we look at the family tree, as I mentioned before, initially, when we started this in 2000, we could only look at the Y chromosome and the maternal DNA. Like I said before, Y chromosome going down the paternal line, mitochondrial down, down the maternal line, and you can clearly identify the origins of those two lines. When it comes to the autosomal DNA, we see the breakdown of the ancestral origins of coming from all of our ancestors, but we cannot identify from whom we received certain ancestry because they are all mixed in our DNA. When we do the autosomal DNA test, we are looking for what's called the AIMS, which is ancestral informative markers. Ancestral informative markers, like in the case of the Y chromosome and the mitochondrial DNA, are mutations that happened a long time, and that as people migrated from one area to another, 
during the evolution of the humankind, and they stayed for thousands and thousands of years in different locations, those mutations developed, and they are specific to the areas that they migrated. So let's go to the next slide, please. Can molecular biology tell us anything about our personal history? So by looking <clears throat> at those sets of mutations that we carry in our DNA, we can determine the migration path of our ancestors because someone that went out of Africa towards Asia and then the Americas will have a set of mutations that is different from someone that left Africa, went through the Middle East, and then up to Europe. So we can distinguish very clearly in someone's DNA those migration paths. And this <clears throat> is the family tree of the humankind. So um, I don't have a point there here, but uh, bear with me here. As people left Africa and they started migration through different areas of the world, and we saw those different migrations, we were able, scientists were able to build what's called the phylogenetic tree of humankind, which is a tree where each branch of the trees has initially same mutations, but as they move along those migration paths, we can see the different mutations according to the different migration paths, and each of those branches of the tree represent a different migration path. So people here in this room, several of us will have the same, will belong to the same branches, and most probably, you can move to the next slide, please. You'll see that each of the branches, I'm taking as example, each of the branches has letters uh, to define them. And uh, for example, the letter E, which involves a series of mutations, represents people that migrated to North Africa. Uh, the letter J represents people that migrated and stayed in the Middle East. And when I say stayed in the Middle East or stayed in other areas of the world, we have to remember that we are talking about tens of thousands of years. Okay? Uh, when we talk about the period covering the Inquisition and forward, we're talking about, about a very small fragment of time in the history of humankind. And so in order to be more specific to a small period of time, a closer period of time, we need really to analyze a lot more people. With the people that we have analyzed and that scientists have analyzed across the world, we are able to determine the big branches of humankind. To the next slide, please. <clears throat> and this is a map that represents the migration that I was talking about that can be determined through the study of the different mutations that we see to, in different people. Uh, it's, it's unfortunately a little bit messy, but it represents all the branches of humankind for the Y chromosome. The same way we have the migration paths representing the mitochondrial DNA. Next slide, please. Uh, now going to the third set of sets, which is the autosomal DNA, this, uh, this uh, chart here tells us about how much DNA we have from different uh, people that are related to us. Now, as you can see, the farther back we go in terms of generations, the lesser the amount of DNA that we have in us. And therefore, for this kind of analysis of the autosomal DNA, uh, when you pass five or six generations back, the amount of block of DNA that you have from those individuals five or six generations back is very, very small. So let's say, for instance, uh, taking as an example, if I have my Jewish ancestry coming only, only from my father's line, father's, 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 father, and nobody else in my family, no other ancestors, probably in the autosomal DNA, I will not see it because the amount of DNA coming just from one line, remember, we have how many, if you go back five generations, eight, uh, six generations, you have 164 ancestors. So we are talking here about only one line uh, bringing the Jewish ancestry out of 164. So it will not show in this third kind of test, but on the Y chromosome test, it will be very, very clear. Next slide, please. So the autosomal test, 
we'll look at more recent generations, at the mutations that we can see at the ancestral informative markers in more recent generations, and it will tell us about the ancestry of a person through the knowledge of what the people are reporting to us. And that's why we call that DNA uh, testing for ancestry purposes has two components. It has the scientific component, which is based on studies that, have, uh, that scientists have performed in different parts of the world. And the second component is what we call guilt by association, which is you do your DNA test, you enter a database, and then you compare yourself to everybody else that we have in the database and to the scientific studies that we have. And so by doing the autosomal test, we were able to classify different regions of the world. And in our database, there are now about, uh, there are 17, 18 regions that we have classified that we can give uh, people's breakdown. And you'll notice here that we have a group even for the Ashkenazi diaspora that can be identified through this test. And we are now in the process of updating our algorithm to include the Sephardic uh, diaspora also. Uh, the reason being is that um, in, the, in the 15, 16 years that we've been around, we were able to gather a lot more DNA from people of Ashkenazi ancestry than of Sephardic ancestry. That's uh, really unfortunate, uh, but uh, the, the, we, we have a good core of samples from Ashkenazi, and only more lately we, uh, we managed to get samples of people of Sephardic ancestry so that we can add a cluster of uh, Sephardic people for the purposes of doing that other thing that I mentioned, the guilt by association. Uh, who are the Jews on a genetic level? Next slide. So if you remember the presentation of Professor Della Pergola, and he was mentioning a little bit about the DNA, and the, coincidentally we're using the same colors because he referred to the green, <laughs> to the light green and to the dark green as a big Jewish cluster. And we're talking here about the uh, the um, Y chromosome as an example, you'll see that among Sephardic, this branch in the tree of humankind that corresponds to the letter J, which is the Middle Eastern branch, corresponds to about 48% of all the Sephardic in the world. And then you have another branch that is the e E1B, which corresponds to the North Africa area, which is another big thing that we see, a big portion that we see among Jews the Sephardic Jews. Now let's look at what the Ashkenazi pie looks like. Next slide. Wow. The green is also very predominant. The J is also very predominant among the Ashkenazi, as it is the E1B. Now remember what I said. We are talking about deep ancestral origins, about the tree of the humankind. So it's not surprising that Sephardic and Ashkenazi have the same common origins. And this is based on scientific studies. Now let's go to the next slide. Middle Eastern non-Jews. So you can see that the origin of Ashkenazi and Sephardic is also in the Middle East, like the Arabs. Okay? So scientifically, it's very clear that the, where the origins of the Jews is, and that Jews and Ashkenazi are belonging to the same clusters. Next, we'll go to the next slide. Now I'm going to go through a, a few other personal stories, uh, just for your entertainment, and to show also this issue that I mentioned about guilt for, by association. And those stories involve people of Sephardic, of Anusim uh, origin. So, next slide. <clears throat> this is from Javier Caldes, uh, who tells us that uh, he was uh, from uh, uh, Chueta origin, and uh, Palma de Mallorca, which has a good uh, number of uh, Jewish of Anusim uh, background. And uh, he's done his DNA test, but if you look at the names that he's matching, he has as matches, and I removed the first names because of privacy issues, so I only left the last names. 
but you'll see that the mitochondrial DNA is matching with a lot of people of Jewish ancestry. And look at the ancestors of several of these people of uh, Jewish ancestry here, okay? Let's go to the next slide. Uh, the countries where these people are coming from. And you see among them uh, very, uh, various countries, but you'll see here in the comments Ashkenazi, most of them Ashkenazi, but some Sephardic also. This is because of the fact that I mentioned earlier that unfortunately we don't have as many Sephardic people tested as Ashkenazi. But on the other hand, it uh, reinforces the idea that Ashkenazi and Sephardic have the same background. On his Y chromosome side, because remember we were talking about the mitochondrial side, we see clearly that he's not of Jewish ancestry. His paternal line is not of Jewish ancestry, and we can see by his matches on the paternal line. Next slide, please. Uh, looking at his autosomal test, the, 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 the blocks of DNA that he received from all his ancestors, we can see all the breakdown of his ancestral origins, and we have very, see a very strong presence of the South Europe and the Iberian Peninsula. And now, exactly now, we are in the process, like I said, of updating the algorithm. So the next version of the same slide will show a separation of non-Jewish Iberian Peninsula results and Sephardic ancestry. So in his next, uh, in his version two, he'll have the component of a cluster of Sephardic origin. Next slide, please. Uh, Showing just a few names that he matches, we can move to the next slide. Berta Sanchez, she was born in Spain with a Catholic family, oral tradition of Sephardic ancestry, unable to document tradition using conventional genealogy, turned to DNA test in order to see if she can find something. Next slide. Look at her matches uh, there which um, shows several people uh, of uh, Hispanic names, but look at the ancestral origins of a couple of them. Salonique, which is where a lot of the Sephardic uh, people went after the Inquisition. Uh, Hannah Toby Toledano, another name of a Sephardic origin. Next slide. Uh, Berta Sanchez, and let's look at the countries of origin uh, where she has association with, and in this case we had enough people that, where she can say that I am guilt by association. Look how many Sephardic here in my matching uh, page. Next page. Acosta, this guy, uh, it's a very, it's a Portuguese name. He came to us without knowing anything. He did not know if uh, what was his origin. He was in search of his identity. Look at his matches in the database. Ashkenazi, 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 all of them Ashkenazi, Sephardic, and I can bet that once we increase the number of people of Sephardic ancestry in our database, he will be matching to more Sephardic. Next. Uh, same thing as before. If you look also at his um, names that he's matching, Jewish ancestry, uh, the ancestors that he's matching, people of Jewish ancestry, and even you'll see a, a couple of them in Arabic. Why is that? Uh, remember the first slide that I showed you about the non-Jewish Middle Eastern matching with Ashkenaz and Sephardic? There you go, another proof here in his matches. Next one. Jimenez, another case of someone looking for his Jewish ancestry, Sephardic ancestry, and in the comments line you see a lot of comments of uh, Ashkenazi, Sephardic, Mizrahi, etc. His breakdown of ancestral origins in terms of the autosomal DNA, again pointing to the south, uh, to the Iberian Peninsula and south uh, Mediterranean area. Next one. That's a closing slide. There is so much, this is a joke that was published in a magazine. Need dollars for DNA test. Girlfriend might be sister. <laughs> so the reason I'm putting this, this here is because although um, this was a joke, given the amount of endogamy that's found in Jewish populations, 
Um, this might not be a joke. Thank you very much.